Bonjour and welcome back to the World History Course. This is your professor, Philippe Girard. In this section, we've been studying Latin America before and after the Spanish conquest. We asked ourselves how Native American civilizations like the Mayans and the Tainos thrived and how they collapsed. Today, our focus will be on the Aztecs, a people also known as the Mexicas, the ancestors of today's Mexicans. As with the rest of the section, we'll spend a good deal of time on our general theme, the downfall of Native American civilizations, but we'll also throw in some other questions about war and religion, which were central to the Aztec world, as well as whether we historians can pass moral judgment on historical figures. That's a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started, by the way. The Aztecs, they lived in the southern part of Mexico, in an area that was home to many civilizations over the years. Not just the Mayas, which we studied earlier in the section, but also the Olmecs and the Toltecs and plenty of others. So Mexico City is not just the largest city in the Americas, it's also the oldest one. In fact, the most impressive monument from those early Mexican civilizations lies just outside Mexico City, in Teotihuacan. That's an absolutely massive complex of plazas, avenues, and pyramids, really just magnificent. So the Aztecs, they came to that area, South Central Mexico, rather late in the game, in the 1300s. So originally they would have lived much further north, in the desert area that corresponds to northern Mexico or the southwestern US today. And the Aztecs, they migrated south over the years, eventually making their way all the way to the valley where Mexico City is today. So my guess is that they were attracted to the region's mild climate, uh, the rich volcanic soil, and the presence of water. But the Aztecs, they had a more inspiring origin story to explain how they came to settle where they did. And according to their foundation myth, they were told by the god to settle wherever they would encounter an eagle devouring a serpent on top of a cactus. That was the omen. And as they got to the shores of Lake Texcoco, here in southern Mexico, lo and behold, in a marshy area in the middle of that lake, they saw an eagle eating a serpent on a cactus. So they figured, this is where our God wants us to settle. And that's where Mexico City is today. And that's a pretty story, so pretty in fact that it has become the coat of arms of Mexico. Just look closely, next time you see a flag of Mexico, it's right there in the middle. But as a historian, I tend to be practical and even cynical. I often have doubts about these convenient foundation myths. My guess is that when the Aztecs got to the Central Valley of Mexico, they were far from the first people there. All the good spots along the shore had been taken by earlier inhabitants, so the Aztecs were stuck with the least desirable place, that marsh in the middle of Lake Texcoco, and so they settled there. And then came up with a great story to justify why they selected this spot. That's my guess. But remember, as a historian, you should not take stories at face value. Critical thinking. That's the key. Whatever happened, the Aztecs made the most of these inauspicious circumstances, and over the next decades, through strategic marriages, war, and just sheer brutality, they were able to impose their rule over all near the nearby city-states and make themselves the dominant power in central Mexico. Most amazingly, they turned their swamp on Lake Texcoco into an amazing city of several hundred thousand people, the Venice of the New World. Their capital was known as Tenochtitlan, and if you go to Mexico City, which is the modern equivalent of where Tenochtitlan used to be, it's kind of hard to get a good sense of uh, the lay of the land back in Aztec times. For one thing, Lake Texcoco is mostly gone, so the modern city has swallowed up most of the lake bed. Also, most of the Aztec monuments were destroyed after the Spanish conquest, so most of the buildings you'll see in Mexico City today are from the Spanish colonial era, or simply modern Mexico. But in the 1970s, uh, workers digging up the ground for a parking lot in the center of the city found the remnants of two ancient pyramids, and they were the Templo Mayor, the big temple complex that used to tower above Tenochtitlan back in Aztec times. So you can get a glimpse of you know, the, the lost world of Tenochtitlan. Those two pyramids, by the way, they were dedicated to the god of the sun, with Silopochtli, and the god of the rain, Tlaloc. And we encountered variations of these gods when we studied the Mayas. Uh, and we also encountered the kind of 
architecture that was the same, the pyramids, and that should be a there should not be a big surprise there. After all, all these uh, Central American civilization, they shared many cultural traits. Same thing with the writing system or the calendar system. Also, like the Mayas, the Aztecs built their pyramids on top of the previous ones. So if you walk through the ruins of the Templo Mayor in Mexico City today, from the outside of the ruins to the interior, you'll encounter one layer after another, like an onion. Uh, which correspond to the various pyramids that were added over time, all the way to the tiny original pyramids in the middle. Nearby, in Aztec times, there were two-story palaces reserved for the elite, and then further out from the city center, one-story homes for commoners, and then further out again, the lake itself. And the various areas of the town were connected by roads and bridges and canals, just like in Venice. And then there were three big causeways leading from the city itself to the shores of Lake Texcoco. So really impressive engineering considering that the city was built in a marsh. So feeding such a large population, that was a feat of its own. Uh, fishing from the lake was one option, but obviously not enough to feed a large city like that. So the Aztecs built raised gardens in Lake Texcoco, which were known as chinampas. And to create those raised gardens, the, the chinampas, the Aztecs would dig up the dirt from the bottom of the shallow lake, which they would then use to form small islands where they could grow local crops, such as tomatoes, hot peppers, beans, and that American staple corn, basically all the ingredients to fill a modern corn tortilla. And those chinampas, they were made of rich lake bed soil, and they also had easy access to water from the lake, and in the temperate climate that you find in uh, central Mexico, they were extremely productive, agriculturally speaking. And then exporting the product, um, that was also a snatch, because a dug up area between the chinampas that would form a canal where flat bottom boats could navigate uh, to and from the city of Tenochtitlan. And as a result, you probably had two to three hundred thousand people in the city alone, uh, which was far more than any medieval European city outside Byzantium. Most of Lake Texcoco has disappeared today, but if uh, you go to the neighborhood of Xochimilco in Mexico City, uh, you can still see some of these old chinampas if you're interested. Aztec society, like many societies that we've studied in the course, it was sharply divided alongside class lines. Uh, there were nobles, and then there were commoners, and then slaves as well. And so the Aztec elite at the top, that consisted of priests and warriors, uh, plus a few other privileged groups like uh, rich merchants. And then common uh, people at the bottom, they were usually farmers. And social mobility between the two was limited, but there was a way to rise from the commoner class to the elite. It was to become a great warrior, and especially to capture POWs in combat. More on that later. There was a strict legal code to distinguish between two, these two social classes, the uh, elites and the commoners. A member of the elite, uh, they could build a two-story house. Uh, they could consume chocolate and they could have multiple wives and concubines if they were males. Uh, but common people at the bottom, they had to be monogamous and they led a far more Spartan lifestyle. In the US today, we have a system called the rule of law, uh, meaning that the law is the same for everybody, whether rich um, or poor uh, or powerful. Well, unless your name is Jeffrey Epstein or, I don't know, Roger Stone. Uh, but in the Aztec world, there were two sharply divergent legal systems, uh, one for the nobles and one for the commoners. They did not live by the same law. Uh, punishments were especially hard for members of the common class. Uh, the death penalty would punish grave offenses, like, say, homicide or rape, uh, but also lesser crimes like adultery, tax fraud, incest, homosexuality, cross-dressing, looking at the member of the nobility in the face, and insubordination, however the judges decide to define that. And for acts of treason against the state, the offender was tortured to death, his house was destroyed, and his family members were enslaved for four generations. Don't try that. And for theft, uh, the first offense resulted in temporary enslavement, and then the second offense earned the death penalty. Slanderers. Uh, they would have their lips cut off. And public drunkenness even, that was punishable by death, except if you were an old person, in that case, you could legally get drunk. 
as for the elites, the main punishment was to be downgraded to commoner status, which hints at the huge gap between one class and the other. You'll notice that I did not mention imprison uh, imprisonment, and it's because there were no prisons in the Aztec world. Prisons were deemed too expensive, so punishments like death and torture and enslavement, uh, these were used instead. Also, prison might have seemed a bit too mild in a society known for its brutality. Though, to be fair, many other societies that we studied in the class were also rather brutal. Uh, we read the Code of Laws of Hammurabi in Section 1, and that also was unequal and harsh. Uh, the Spanish, they were quick to point uh, to the many forms of cruelty in the Aztec world because that was a way to justify the conquest of Mexico. Uh, but Spain, in medieval times, that was also sharply divided along class lines. And Spain was also dominated by priests and warriors. And it also inflicted horrible penalties on social deviants, such as burning religious heretics and Jews alive at the stake. So it's really a matter of the pot calling the kettle black. Which brings us to an interesting concept that we often encounter in history, and the concept of moral relativism. That's the idea that the concept of what is right and wrong, morality, ethics, that can vary from one society to the next. And there is nothing fundamentally just. There are no universal values. Good and bad, they vary depending on where you live and when. Think back to the lecture on the Greeks in section one. We saw that some Greek city-states, like Sparta, they had fundamentally different views from us on matters like marriage, or education, or infanticide. Heck, even the Athenians were okay with eugenics and enslaving people or treating their women like dirt, which we'd find offensive today. So how can you tell what is wrong and what is right, even if even ancient Athens, the birthplace of Socrates and Plato, and the very concept of Essex, uh, held such different views? So alternatively, some people would reject moral relativism, and instead they would see history as a struggle for freedom and for what is right. And we did notice in section two that most world religions share basic tenets like a ban on lying, or killing, or stealing, or adultery, which would be wrong universally. And so that alternate view that would be called moral idealism, the notion that there is such a thing as right and wrong, which applies to all of mankind. So maybe pause the video for a sec and ask yourself where you stand on that debate, moral relativism or moral idealism. Anyway, let's leave philosophy aside and get back to our historical narrative. It's now time to study two practices that have popped up time and again in the course, religion and war, uh, which were particularly central in the Aztec case. So after the Aztecs settled Tenochtitlan around 1325 AD, uh, they conquered a vast empire that eventually stretched all the way from the Pacific in the west to the Caribbean in the east, and then from the deserts of northern Mexico all the way to the rainforest of Central America to the south. All that in less than 200 years. And they conquered these lands for the usual reasons, including greed, to loot and seize loot and impose tribute on conquered people. But there was also a strong religious undercurrent to all these wars of conquest. It was not just about money. These wars were fought in the name of the main Aztec god, Huitzilopochtli, which, as it happened, was the god of the sun and the god of war. Uh, that would be the scary looking dude that you see here in the middle of that carved circle, which is now on display in Mexico City's uh, Great Anthropology Museum, if you want to see it in the flesh. And so, like most Central American gods, with Silopochtli, he required sacrifices. But a lot of them, typically in human blood, since he was a god of war, and those victims could be slaves or volunteers even, uh, but the best type of human sacrifice for a god of war was a prisoner of war. Which was one big reason why the Aztecs waged so many wars. They wanted to capture land and loot, of course, but also prisoners whom they could then sacrifice to the god of war with Silopochtli. That god also happened to be the god of the sun. So keeping that god happy was a matter of basic survival, because if the god of the sun chose not to rise in the morning, then crops would fail and all of society would collapse. And the Aztecs, they had inherited the calendar system of previous Central American civilizations, like the Mayans, as well as their cyclical vision of time. So there was a particularly important time every 52 years when two of the Aztec slash Maya calendars would come up in sync and there was a risk that the world would come to an end. 
and to avoid that and to convince the sun god to give the humans another 52-year lease on life, the Aztecs would perform the so-called new fire ceremonies, which, you guessed it, required even more human sacrifices than usual. That uh, new fire period, that was also a time when uh, temples were expanded and yet another layer was added to existing pyramids. And that opening ceremony for the larger pyramids required, you guessed it, more human sacrifices. A lot of the society that we've studied in the course practiced human sacrifice, from the Romans to the Congolese, uh, but the Aztecs were unique in the amount of people that they sacrificed. And you might want to skip the next minute if you're squeamish, uh, because I'm getting to the gory part. So the procedure varied depending on which god that you were sacrificing to. Uh, but victims to the sun slash war god, they would be walked up the main temple, made to lie on a sacrificial stone, and then their chest was cut open with a knife made of obsidian stone. Remember, they didn't know about steel. And then the beating heart was torn out and then offered still beating to the sun god. And then priests also occasionally partook in cannibalism. They would eat some of the limbs and the organs of the victims. And then the headless body was thrown down the stairs of the temple, and the next victim was brought up. Wash, rinse, and repeat, and repeat, and repeat, because the Aztecs sacrificed a lot of victims. In one bloody affair uh, to celebrate the opening of the new Templo Mayor in 1487, there were apparently 80,000 sacrifices in just four days, which is just mind-boggling. It's the equivalent of the whole town where I'm living right now. All that lying at the foot of the pyramid. And then the skulls of the victims were washed up and displayed on racks in that special nearby structure, which has been found by archaeologists. So, amazing achievements, building an empire out of nothing, building giant pyramids in the middle of a marsh in a lake, sustaining a large population, uh, but also a cruel, unequal society based on war and human sacrifices. Uh, these were the Aztecs, gentle, noble savages. They were not. There were signs, however, that by the early 1500s, the Aztec Empire was showing some cracks. For one thing, a rival god called Quetzalcoatl was becoming popular among the rank and file. And a Quetzal, that's a beautiful bird from Central America, and then Coatl, that means snake. So Quetzalcoatl. Uh, that would mean the feathered serpent god. And he looks kind of scary when you see him on statues, but he was actually the god of mercy and justice. And uncommonly for Aztec gods, he did not require human sacrifice. So there was clearly a disconnect in an Aztec society between the elites that worshipped a god associated with war and death, and then commoners uh, who preferred a less bloody god who promised a reign of justice and mercy, a kind of a Jesus-like redeeming feature. Another sign of internal social stress, that was the institution of the Flower Wars. And that name sounds innocent enough, uh, but it was yet another violent practice of the Aztecs that involved, you guessed it, human sacrifice. And those Flower Wars evolved pretty late in the Aztec Empire, by which point the Aztecs had been so successful that they had run out of enemies. And for most empires, that would be great news, the onset of a Pax Azteca. Uh, but for the Aztecs, the end of wars, that meant no more battles, where warriors could gain prestige by capturing prisoners, and no more uh, sacrifices to the sun god, which could bring about the end of the world. So peace, that was a real problem for the Aztecs. So the Aztec solution was to go back each year to battle enemy cities that they had already defeated. Think of those civil war buffs who dress in blue and gray and reenact the Battle of Gettysburg every year. Except that in the Aztec case, those battles were real, and whoever was captured in those reenactments, they would be brought back to Tenochtitlan as a POW and sacrificed for real. So the Flyer Wars were meant to ensure that there would be a steady supply of victims for the war god. Except that by the 1500s, there were instances where the Aztecs lost some of those Flyer Wars, which normally should not have happened. They were supposed to be ceremonial battles with a predetermined outcome, like wrestling in a way. But clearly, the rivals of the Aztecs were sick of providing the enemies with an annual tribute of sacrificial victims, and they were ready to fight back. So that was the situation as of 1519, on the eve of the Spanish conquest. Maybe pause for a second and ask yourself, what would be the strengths and the weaknesses of that empire in the eventuality of a war with the Spanish? 
go ahead, pause for a bit and make two columns, uh, the strengths and the weaknesses of the Aztec Empire. Well, on the strength side, uh, the Aztecs were fighting at home. Uh, the empire had a population of 5 million, far more than what Spain could muster overseas. Uh, they were far more warlike than the Tainos, so they were probably not going to submit easily. On the other side, well, the Aztecs were technologically backward. No steel weapons, no guns, no horses, and also no smallpox. So they were susceptible to disease. Also, the Aztec elite was disliked by some of the commoners, as shown by the cult of Quetzalcoatl, and some of their neighbors, as shown by the defeats in the Flower Wars. So maybe, just maybe, a determined Spanish conqueror, if he played his cards just right, he had a one in a million chance of prevailing, which is what we'll study right now. So it's time to introduce our next character, Hernán Cortés. Uh, he was one of those many petty Spanish nobles who would flock to the New World after the first voyage of Columbus. He was living in Cuba when the local Spanish governor asked him to put together a small force to reconnoiter the coast of Mexico, inquire about the rumors of a great empire to the west, and then come back to Cuba to report. Except that Cortes, he overstepped his orders and he hired 500 men, horses, cannons, several ships, because he was planning on an expedition of conquest, not just reconnaissance. Hearing this, the Cuban governor decided to fire Cortes for insubordination. And have you heard of the expression, uh, don't shoot the messenger? Well, that's exactly what Cortes did. He refused to obey the governor's orders and he fled from Cuba before he could be put under arrest. And that gives you an idea of the man, ruthless, insubordinate, and daring. And at this point, either he would succeed, conquer an empire, come back with a lot of gold, and everything would be forgiven. Otherwise, he could be arrested for treason by the governor of Cuba and shot upon his return. So there was no room for failure. Hernán Cortés first got to the coast of Yucatán, the old stomping grounds of the Mayas, and there he encountered a practical problem that people often overlook when they think of the conquest of the Americas, the language barrier. How do you make yourself understood from people who speak a completely alien, non-Indo-European language? And if you're interested in that issue, check out Céline Carillon's book, Eloquence Embodied, which is really great on that topic of cross-cultural communication in the Americas. So in our particular case, we're talking about translating between Spanish, the language of Hernán Cortés, the various Mayan languages of the Yucatan Peninsula, and then Nahuatl, which was the language of the Aztecs. So luckily for him, Hernán Cortés bumped into a sailor named Rejónimo de Aguilar. That sailor had been mar marooned along uh, the coast of Yucatán during a previous Spanish expedition, and he had spent enough time marooned in that region to speak Mayan, so he could act as a translator between those two languages. Another chance encounter uh, was with a lady variously known as Doña Marina, La Malinche, or Madin Sin. Uh, she was of Aztec origin, but she had been sold by her stepdad as a slave, as a child, and she ended up in the Yucatan region of Mexico. And there she had learned a Mayan in addition to her native tongue, Nahuatl. So by using the sailor Rejónimo de Aguilar and the Aztec woman, La Malinche, uh, Cortés could translate things from Spanish into Mayan and then Mayan into Nahuatl. Problem solved. La Malinche, she's a fascinating figure. She eventually learned Spanish as well as Mayan and Aztec, so she could do all the translating herself. Also, because she knew the Aztec world so well, she became uh, the main informant of Hernán Cortés and her advisor. And then uh, she became the confidant of Cortés, uh, the lover, and then the mother of his child. And she played a crucial role in the conquest because she was the one who told Cortés about all the weaknesses of the Aztec Empire, about Quetzalcoatl, and the Flower Wars, and which city might be tempted to switch sides. So for that reason, the term La Malinche could be seen as a traitor in Spanish, uh, the woman who betrayed her people, the Aztecs, uh, though again, she had good reasons for acting the way she did, because her people had sold her off as a slave when she was a little girl. At the same time, because La Malinche, she had children by Spanish fathers, she was the mother of mestizos, the mixed race Iberian and Indian people who form the vast majority of the Mexican population today. So she was, in a way, the mother of modern-day Mexico. And so Mexicans often have mixed views of her. She was a traitor, but also a key historical figure, 
and their direct biological ancestor. She embodies all the contradictions of modern Mexico, a country that is stuck between the Native American heritage of the Aztecs and the legacy of the Spanish colonial era. Diego Rivera, the great 20th century Mexican muralist, uh, he was clearly conflicted about her because in a mural on the Spanish conquest, uh, he included La Marinche right in the middle of that mural, but he hid her behind Cortes, unsure whether to depict her as a heroine or as a villain. So the murals of Diego Rivera, that's yet another thing you need to see in Mexico City after you visit uh, Teotihuacan and the rem uh, remnants of the Templo Mayor and the Museum of Anthropology. And then check out the house of Diego Rivera's wife, Frida Kahlo, because she was another fascinating woman. But back to our narrative. In 1519, Cortes got to what is today Veracruz, Mexico, and there received some envoys from Montezuma, the Aztec emperor. Montezuma was a weak, superstitious leader who didn't know what to make of these strange visitors from the east. La Marinche had told Cortes about the myth of Quetzalcoatl, that gentle god of mercy who had a falling out with the other gods, and Quetzalcoatl was, associ uh, was associated with the year 1 Reed in the Aztec calendar, which corresponds to 1519 in our calendar. And amazingly, 1519, that was the exact same year when Cortes showed up in Mexico. So this enabled Cortes to suggest that he was a god, Quetzalcoatl, returning from exile so as to confuse Montezuma. Anyway, Montezuma noticed how the Spanish loved silver and gold, so he sent some magnificent gifts to Cortes in Veracruz, hoping that this that gift that would satisfy him and convince Cortes to leave. Uh, but the gift had the exact opposite effect. So far, the Spanish had not made much money in the Caribbean, but there, in those gifts, finally, there was proof that there was money to be made in the New World. So Cortes decided to plow ahead with his plans of conquest. He only had 500 men with him against an empire of 5 million, so his men were not sure about the plan. After all, there was a strong chance that they would be defeated and that they would end up being sacrificed in some gruesome way. Well, you know the expression, burning your bridges? Well, uh, Cortes did something like that. Uh, to quell doubts among his men, he simply burnt his ships. This way, there was no way but forward. He and his men would either vanquish the Aztecs or die trying. Since Montezuma did not mount an effective counterattack from the get-go, Cortes was able to make his way inland. And with the help of La Malinche, he recruited various local allies along the way uh, from cities recently conquered by the Aztecs. And in fact, Cortes soon had more Native American warriors on his side than he had Spanish soldiers. And he also had guns and steel and horses and smallpox. So Cortes then reached the capital, Tenochtitlan, which was a revelation to him and his men. Uh, we know of his travels mostly through the writings of Bernard Diaz, one of his traveling companions, and Bernard Diaz was just struck when he first caught sight of the Venice of the New World. Quote, and when we saw all those cities and villages built in the water and all the great towns on dry land and that straight and level causeway leading to Mexico, we were astounded. Those great towns and temples and buildings arising from the water, all made of stone, they seem like an enchanted vision from a fairy tale." End quote. And then they destroyed the place. Uh, Montezuma, he still did not know what to do, so Cortes and his men just walked into the city. And then they toured Tenochtitlan like tourists would today, though they were a bit grossed out by all these temples smeared with the blood of the victims. And then the Spanish were taken in as guests by Montezuma himself. But after a while, the city got restless by the leader's odd behavior. Uh, so a mob showed up at the royal palace to demand that Montezuma do something about these foreign guests slash invaders. And the Aztec Empire, uh, emperor, he showed up at the balcony to try to calm his people, and they stoned him to death. After that, the Aztecs finally attacked the Spanish, who were so badly outnumbered that they had to flee the city of Tenochtitlan and the Aztecs had destroyed the causeways leading to the shore, so the Spanish had to waddle ashore. And some of the conquistadors, they were so overloaded with loot that they sank and they drowned in the lake because of the greed. Talk about the karma. The Spanish called that retreat La Noche Triste, the Night of Sorrows. At that point, most men would have called it quits. Clearly, the conquest was a pipe dream. But Cortes, he was not most men. 
he decided to stick around nonetheless, recruit more local allies and build a fleet with local trees. And this way he could harass the Aztecs from Lake Texcoco and blockade the city, the same way that he would besiege in Givo Castle. Which is exactly what happened. The large population of Tenochtitlan, they grew hungry when they lost access to the fishing grounds and the chinampas on the lake. And then they got sick because, unbeknownst to him, and uh, the others, Cortes and the other Spanish, they had left a parting gift before fleeing during the Noche Triste, smallpox. And that disease grew wild in the confines of an overcrowded, hungry city like Tenochtitlan. And then after the disease had run its course, Cortes attacked again and retook Tenochtitlan with the help of his uh, Native American allies, and he toppled the successor of Montezuma, and he earned one of the most stunning victories in military history. That campaign has been studied a lot. Uh, it's not often that people conquer an empire of 5 million people, a warlike empire too, which was 500 warriors. So to explain this surprising victory, uh, historians often cite the superior, uh, superior Spanish weaponry, uh, the inspired leadership of Cortes, and the indecisiveness of Montezuma, uh, the intelligence provided by La Malinche, uh, divisions within the Aztec world, and then of course, smallpox. Still, it was a major upset. In history, we don't just study events because they are surprising or interesting, but we also do so because they are relevant. So what did the conquest of Tenochtitlan change in Mexico in the long run? Well, quite a bit, and that will be our last topic for today. Obviously, the first major consequence was the end of the Aztec Empire and its replacement uh, by a Spanish colony known as Nueva España, or New Spain, roughly Mexico today. But the changes for the average Aztec, they went much deeper than that. The traditional elites were gone, well, unless they intermarried with the Spanish conquerors to start new mixed race dynasties. And then the rest of the population also collapsed with the arrival of new diseases, probably a 90% drop. And that was dramatic in its own right, but it also led to the Aztecs to ask themselves, what have we done wrong? How come our gods have abandoned us and killed us in all these mysterious ways, whereas the conquerors, they seem immune to all these new plagues. So the Aztecs uh, really doubted themselves. New crops came along with the Colombian exchange too, including strange new animals like horses and cows and pigs, so that was a change. And then the survivors, they were split into groups and allotted to conquerors, like Cortes, according to the repartimiento system uh, that was first used against the Tainos of the Caribbean. We studied it last time. So average Aztecs, they now became pretty much serfs of the new Iberian elite. Uh, those serfs were also called peons. Uh, that's a system that endured throughout the colonial era and even beyond in 19th century Mexico. The city of Tenochtitlan that also underwent major physical changes after the conquest. Uh, the lake was slowly filled up as the city grew, the Great Pyramids were raised to the ground, and the stone was used to build Catholic churches to show that the new god had vanquished the old. Nowhere is this more striking than in Tlatelolco, which is another neighborhood of uh, Mexico City, because there a church was built on top of the old pyramid using the stone. And some modern governed buildings are just around the corner, so the area is known as the Plaza de Tres Culturas, uh, the Square of Three Cultures. And the same is true in the Zócalo, the central square of Mexico City. There you have the ruins of the old Templo Mayor of the Aztecs in one corner, and then you have Spanish era buildings as a cathedral in another corner, and then modern government buildings. So the three eras of Mexico's history, pre-Columbian, colonial, and post-independence uh, that are expressed in the very footprint of the city. The various layers of Mexico's history are also expressed through racial dynamics. Mexico today, that's home to a large Native American population, people who are the descendants of the Mayas and the Aztecs, but Mexico also has an even larger mixed-race mestizo population, and then a minority of whites of direct Spanish descent. So in Spanish colonial times, those racial differences were built into the law. The authorities would classify all the possible racial combinations of white, Indian, and then black into various groups. Uh, they called them castas, the castes. And then they made rules that said that, I don't know, only pure-blooded whites born in Spain could be appointed governor, for example. And in a way, we're still living with the consequences of that racial order as those racial hierarchies have endured in modern day Mexico, even though technically, uh, since the 1917 revolution, everybody is equal under the law nowadays in Mexico. I'll give you just one example. 
in 2018, the movie Roma, uh, it made quite a stir because it covered a white family in Mexico City and it chose to focus on the Indian maid instead of the upper class members of the family, which apparently no Mexican director had thought of doing before, a story about an Indian maid. And that movie was such a hit internationally that the actress who played the maid, Yaritza Aparicio, she was featured on the cover of Vogue magazine in Mexico, which again was a first. Even though most Mexicans are Indians or mestizos, previous issues had preferred to feature white actresses and celebrities because that was a standard of beauty inherited from Spanish colonial times. So we're talking about 2018, not 1518. Clearly that takes a long time for mentalities to change and for people to accept Native Americans as equal. So building styles merged after the conquest as well as races, but so did religions. I've often used the term syncretism in the class whenever two religions merged. Well, that happened in Mexico too. Shortly after the conquest, the Virgin Mary allegedly appeared before a peasant in Mexico. And the Catholic Church jumped on that miracle to argue that God approved of the conquest, remember the three genes, and the Church used that miracle to help convert Aztecs to Christianity. And still today, the Shrine of the Virgin of Guadalupe in Mexico City uh, that remains the largest pilgrimage site in Mexico. But it's worth noting that the peasant in question was an Aztec, that the Virgin Mary spoke to him in Nahuatl, the Aztec language, instead of Spanish, and that the Virgin Mary, the way that peasant described her, he, she bore a lot of resemblances to a pre-Columbian Aztec goddess. So maybe that peasant had an Aztec, pagan religious experience that had nothing to do with Mary. And then that event was used by the church to facilitate conversion. So I see the cult of the Virgin of Guadalupe as an example of cultural fusion between the conqueror and the conquered, rather than a 100% eradication of the previous culture and its replacement uh, with the Catholic one. Which would seem more consistent with the overall cultural fusion that happened in all colonial societies in the New World, where the old and the new merge into a hybrid Creole mix. We'll see that with the Incas next time too. At any rate, this takes us pretty far from the initial conquest and into more esoteric discussion onto the composite soul of Mexico. So I'll have to stop here. If you want to learn more, I'll let you watch the movie Roma, or look up the murals of Diego Rivera, or even better, travel to Mexico City to see them in person, or even better, listen to the show that I did on La Malinche and Frida Kahlo for the University Radio. But that's it for today. Next time we will head to Peru to study my favorite Native American civilization, and that would be the Incas, and maybe destroy it too. That seems to be the theme of that section. In the meantime, au revoir and goodbye. Hasta luego.